Communications, Mollick speaking. Well, Ed, how are you? Thousand head of cattle need to move. Okay, Ed, listen, what, uh, what zones are they located in? Zones five and seven. Okay. How soon do they have to move? Within a week. Okay, listen, Ed, I'll give this to Jim and have him check with the meat department, and I'll have Lance call you back on how we made out, okay? You bet, Ed. Jim, want to take this over to the meat department and check it out, see what they can do. Let me know. Gene, we've got a thousand head of cattle in the West Omaha area, and we need, we've only got a week to get them out. Can you help us with it? Okay, we'll take care of it. The rate to Dennis and Dern? No, our bed over in the Omaha area has got a thousand head of cattle. The grades are listed there that have to be moved in the next five days. Take care of it. Okay, I'll get on right away. Hello. Hello, Lester. This is Narb here in the meat department. Yes. We have a thousand head of cattle in the Nebraska area that we have to move in the next five days. Have you got room for them there? There'll be 80% choice, about 20 goods. They weigh between 1,050 and 1,100. Uh, just a second. Yes, I can handle uh, 400 head of them if you can get them here in two days. Okay, you can take 400 in the next two days. Okay, real good, Lester. I'll move the other someplace else then. Okay, thank you. Hello, Marion? Yeah, this is Norb in the meat department. We have 600 head of cattle in Nebraska that we have to move in the next five days. How many can you handle there? There'll be 80% choice, weighing about 1,050 to 1,100. You're all filled up. Okay. All right, I'll check with Ernest in Sioux City and move them down there then. Okay, thank you. Yes, this is Nora. Say, we've got 600 head of cattle in Nebraska that we've got to move over the next five days. Do you have room for them there? They'll be about 80% choice and weigh between 1,050 and 1,100. Okay, you can take them then. Okay, real good, Ernest. All right, thank you. Hello, Lance? Yes. I have them all cattle all taken care of. Now we'll move 400 of them into St. Joe in the next two days. And the other 600 we'll move into Sioux City in the next five days. Okay, Ed. We've taken care of your cattle. We've got 600 head to go to Sioux City, spread over the next five days. And you can take the other 400 to St. Joe over the next two days. That's okay, Ed. Glad to help you. Hello, everybody. We're greeting you today from the Dugdale Packing Plant here in St. Joseph, Missouri. Dugdale Packing Company is one of the largest independent packers in the whole country. Fact of the matter is, uh, this plant is a growing plant, and I'm sure that NFO production is partly responsible for that because we're sitting here to show you something of its growth on uh, the edge of some new cattle pens that are being built here.
to handle the uh, influx of NFO cattle as well as cattle from other sources. With me today is my old friend, Mr. Lester Carr, who is NFO packing plant representative. Les and I have known each other for a number of years. Les has been a farmer around this part of Missouri for perhaps longer than he'd like to admit. Les, right. how many <laughs> acres are you farming uh, now? 225. Well, are you able to uh, hold down this important role here and still uh, run your farm without help, or do you hire people? I hire out? some on the uh, uh, specified time, see, like putting up hay and yeah. putting in some crops, but I do the most of it myself on the weekends and like of that, see, right. and still come down here and spend the day here at Dugdale's. Now, Les, you have a specialized job here representing NFO members at this packing plant. I presume that you have counterparts all over the country doing the same thing. Yes, we do have in the United States. Yes, we're set up in several different plants. Well, now, could you tell us in a detailed manner, step by step, exactly what you do here? Well, my, I'm representing the, the National Farmers Organization. I uh, book cattle for the members to be delivered at the plant at a specified time. Uh, first, the member in each county uh, calls the county bargaining supervisor and tells them well, how many cattle and what time he wants to deliver. And in turn, then the county bargaining supervisor calls me a uh, day ahead of time when these cattle are supposed to arrive, see? And uh, I book them up, and then in turn, I. Uh, contact uh, the boy at the, the dock where they're being unloaded and we book them up that way so we keep an even flow of cattle coming to the plant mm -hmm. which is a great service to a packer him knowing exactly how many cattle he's going to have on the kill right right well so you can anticipate the uh, the influx in here at any given time right for uh, example I, today you know exactly how many cattle are coming in here tomorrow right right that's right well now you follow these cattle less as I understand it uh, from the time the truck backs in here and unloads on to the killing floor and through the entire process right Could you tell us about some of your duties uh, in these areas well I watch them unload the cattle and uh, see if they're not uh, crowding them and causing them to get bruises see cattle can be bruised when they're unloaded around out the end of the trucks you know the end gate and uh, and this is very costly. Well, bruises mean a loss of, uh, of income because right. uh, it downgrades the, the beef and, uh, and the NFO farmer simply uh, isn't making the money that he would otherwise, right? right. So we, we, we were very particular about the cattle here and the unloading operation as they go from, from the truck into the scale to be weighed live and then put in the pens and uh, then later on, after they've rested, we'd run them on the kill. And now, you said the key word, uh, rested. Right. As I understand it, uh, cattle in the process of being trucked uh, and herded into a place like Dugdale uh, get nervous. And this can really affect the grade, can't it? That's right. What uh, do you do about that, Les? Well, what, uh, what we do is uh, pen the cattle and... Uh, let them rest, uh, let's say, three or four hours, such a matter, maybe longer. Uh, depends on the cattle, if they're, you can tell by looking at them, if they're nervous. And nervous cattle uh, just will not uh, bleed out properly, and this also affects the uh, grading cattle, because cattle are graded on the color of the meat, as well as the amount of marbling in the loin eye. So, okay, at that point, then, you follow them right onto the kill floor. Tell us about that. Right, and uh, I see it uh, if they're booked up properly uh, to go on the kill at a, at a certain time. And, uh, and by the way, all cattle are killed in lot numbers, like if a man brought 20 head of, of cattle in here. And uh, if they're booked up, 20 is going to follow 10 ahead of them, and then maybe 15 going to be behind that. And that way we keep them separate so those cattle will not get mixed up. The only thing that will get cattle mixed up at this plant is the farmer or the uh, trucker that brings them in usually. He has picked up Sam Jones's or somebody's cattle and he went over here and got uh, some from somebody else and see and 
and uh, he gets here at the plant he unloads and he says well i think those belong to so-and-so sam jones and, <laughs> yeah. but he's not too sure right. see so he gets them mixed up telling the boy on the dock whose cattle's what so there's a, there's the problem right there on a mixed up load but whenever they are identified properly they go through here in a lot number and uh, that is one thing that we're watching very particular now you um on the kill floor and following uh, following the beef then on through, uh, you work with, or at least you have an opportunity to observe and talk with government inspectors. Right. Uh, the, they have uh, federal meat inspectors in this plant, and uh, they inspect every half a beef as it comes down or every beef carcass in the plant. And I can be in there and watch them and see uh, what they're designated as a bruise to be cut off and question them on it, see? And uh, therefore, uh, you know, you could argue with them but to a certain extent on it. Now, as I understand it, in this matter of grading, uh, you have the privilege of, uh, of asking the grading people to wait to grade uh, some beef. In other words, if, if, if you feel that by waiting a few hours, uh, beef will get a better grade. You have the privilege to bring that about. Is this correct? Right. You see, cattle that's being killed today would be graded tomorrow. So therefore, they would cool out approximately 24 hours. And when the grader starts of the morning grading cattle, why, maybe they're not properly cool. You can tell by the feeling of the beef whether it's firm enough and what, uh, what is the process is going on here is the uh, cooling out of the uh, of the fat in other words so as it will show up and in other words they call it marbling in the in the loin eye in the muscular lean so when that's cooled out properly why it'll all show up so uh, the standard set up by the grader uh, department they go by this to determine what grade is going to be so therefore if uh, we would wait uh, let's say um, the grader was here grading uh, like in the morning, say eight, nine o'clock, and those cattle are not properly cooled out yet. But we wait till say two to three o'clock this afternoon to give a final grade on, which might up the grade, which does a lot of times. Here we go again. Here we go again, and uh, a couple they, of bucks uh, right. uh, here and there. So as you were saying a while ago, yes, a six hundred pound steer that'd be twelve dollars. And a two dollar difference in right. the good from a choice. Right. So. That would mean quite a bit on a hundred head of cattle. Well, now, how is the price Dugdale pays for NFO cattle determined? Uh, we got a pricing formula uh, arrangement set up with the Dugdale Packing Company, and uh, on a grade and yield basis, off of the uh, yellow sheet price, which is dressed meat market seed. Yes. So it's determined off of this. Les, are you sure that uh, NFO members are getting this price? Yes, I am certain, because uh, I have uh, Mr. Dugdale's uh, secretaries give me a copy of everybody's uh, green yield sheet, which I have right here. So I take these sheets every day, and I have the copy of the yellow sheet, and I check the price on the sheet here according to what the yellow sheet uh -huh. and the green bond price is. Well, now, would you list some of the advantages of selling on this basis? Well, uh, as a Cattle go through the plant, they go through on individual merits. If a uh, man brings in 20 steers, let's say, and uh, here goes one, number one through, and uh, he's a choice steer, well, that's what he's going to be because uh, uh, the government man's doing the grading, strictly government. It's nothing that Doug Dale has anything to do with. It. Yeah. Right. And so, therefore, uh, this would mean dollars and cents in the pocket book, well, see? So, if you're buying them on foot, uh, there's more guesswork that way because the, the, if I was a buying cattle, in which the buyers do too, I would want to guess the lower, so I would come out on the great yield, which is the way they all wind up. There's no eye determination, no guesswork involved in it. Right. Well, that makes for, for a good system, right. I would say. Do you uh, represent here at Dugdale uh, any uh, members that are, or rather any farmers that are not NFO members? No, I cannot. No, just strictly NFO members. Well, now, Les, would you mind briefly summarizing the points you've made? Tell us uh, 
rather briefly exactly what you do here as uh, the NFO packing plant representative? Well, first, uh, they're booking the cattle with me, and I can uh, regulate the flow of cattle coming in each day according to what possibly they might want each day, maybe up or down, and uh, checking the cattle for bruises and uh, seeing that they're you know, properly handled and uh, quieted down, as I stated a while ago, so they will grade better. And, uh, and then also is uh, checking on the price and seeing that they're getting the, the price agreed upon on the uh, agreement and the contract. This is just another way, folks, in my opinion, that NFO protects the interests of its members. We've been visiting here in St. Joseph, Missouri from the Dugdale Packing Company with the National Farmers Organization's packing plant representative, Mr. Lester Carr. It must be obvious to all of you looking in on today's U.S. Farm Report that the subject of our show is communications. And it is only logical that we should welcome to our show our two guests who are very much involved with communications with the National Farmers Organization. On my left is Don Zamalek, who is Director of Communications for NFO. Don, a pleasure to have you with us today. And on my right is Don's very capable and able assistant, Jim Horn. Jim, welcome to you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Don, what are the duties and responsibilities of the Communications Department? Uh, Bill, the main responsibility is to assist our members to block their production together nationwide. This production is bargained for by the dairy, grain, meat, specialty commodities departments, and they bargain for and get contracts uh, with processors for our members' production. And once the contracts are ratified, by the members and then activated, the communication structure helps the members meet the delivery commitments under these contracts. Mm. Jim, will you explain the structure that the NFO communications department uses? Right. Bill, what we have is a structure established whereby in each county we have developed a super county bargaining structure. And this structure is divided into four sections to whereby we have a section foreman who is responsible for working with the bargaining coordinators in each section. And the bargaining coordinator, as you see here, contacts not more than eight of his neighbors who are members mm -hmm. to inventory their production each week or each month. These bargaining coordinators then bring this information on paper to their section foreman. With each section foreman attending a special structure meeting, bringing that information to the county, bar <coughs> county bargaining supervisor, to whereby he has a total of the amount of production available to be bargained for under contract with the NFO. The county bargaining supervisors then, in each zone, bring this information to the zone supervisor, who is responsible to get this information into the marketing area chief. Now we have seven zone supervisors in each marketing area. Mm -hmm. Bringing this information together, the marketing area chief has a total amount of production available to meet commitments under contract and also <clears throat> to bargain for additional production which they have in each of one of these marketing areas. The marketing area chief then brings this information by telephone to the communications department in the national office. We tabulate this information from each marketing area, and then we have this information available to the dairy, grain, and meat department for bargaining purposes. Well now, Don, how many marketing areas does NFO have established at this time? Uh, there are now 47 in operation with several others in the planning state. Well, are these marketing area chiefs who are supervisory personnel, highly trained people, Don? Yes, they, they must be in order to carry out their responsibilities. Well, now, how are they trained? Uh, we have periodic training sessions with our chiefs, and during these sessions, we instruct them in detail on the latest proven procedures of operations, including planning, knowledge of NFO marketing programs, and so forth. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in addition, we provide the latest in audio-visual aids so that these men can not only benefit themselves through a better understanding uh, of how to carry out their responsibilities, but also to enable them to assist our zone supervisors and county leaders to do a more effective job. Then, on occasion, we also have department personnel working with our chiefs right out in the marketing areas, not only to train the chiefs, but to find out even better methods of operation than we're now using. Mm -hmm. Well, now, how often does a marketing area chief contact the national office? Uh, normally, every day, and quite often, several times a day. Well, now, what does he report to you when he contacts the office? Uh, he reports in detail his own activity, the activities of his zone supervisors, and we know daily the number of contacts made with our members, the meetings attended, the amount of production blocked together, and how the contract deliveries are going in that market. Mm -hmm. Now, Jim, you've talked <clears throat> about the importance a little while ago of the super county bargaining structure. Are there any planning meetings? Yes, there are. Well, now, how are these planning meetings carried out exactly? Well, every month prior to the regular county meeting, there's a special structure meeting called a week ahead of this monthly meeting. And the purpose of this meeting is to find out and know how much production is available to meet the commitments under contract and how much production over and above these commitments we have blocked together mm -hmm. to bargain for. Now, these meetings are conducted by the county bargaining supervisor and attended by the assistant county bargaining supervisor, the county chairman, all section foremen, the elected dairy, grain, meat, and specialty commodity committee chairman, the collection point representative, the grain sales coordinator, and the zone supervisor. At this meeting, a report is given by each section foreman, giving the total amount of production from his section from all the members which will be available to be bargained for in that particular section. Mm -hmm. The county bargaining supervisor then has a total for the entire county, production available to meet contract commitments and also to fulfill marketing arrangements when we have additional production. Mm -hmm. Then the elected dairy, grain, meat, and special commodity department committee chairman each give a report on contracts affecting their county. Now they also report on how much production was sold last month. These elected committee chairmen report the progress of their committees working directly with the dairy, grain, and meat department departments in the national office. The special structure meetings show progressive farmers in action blocking their production together nationwide to bargain, not beg, for a price. Don, has there been a structure in agriculture set up along these lines Certainly not nationwide, and to my knowledge, not even in a local situation. Well, then why was it necessary for NFO to set up this kind of a structure? We found out early in the game that large nationwide companies with processing plants in several states and even coast to coast were able to outmaneuver us in bargaining because of their ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. So NFO has met the challenge, and we're the first farm organization to match their communications. And in many cases, I feel we've surpassed them. Jim, uh, is NFO successful? Yes, sir. Well, now, why do you say this? Why do you say that NFO is successful? For the first time in history, farmers and ranchers have blocked their production together nationwide wide and bargained for contracts. Now, Jim, I want to ask you this. Can you give me general specifics on how NFO has been able to raise farm prices? Right. By blocking production together nationwide and selling under supply contracts, we have kept low price areas from being used by the four or five large companies to lower prices in high priced areas. Mm -hmm. Now, supply contracts are the key because we have pricing formulas which maintain our gains and are the basis for improvement. By moving production into new marketing patterns, creating a vacuum, companies that are not getting their production from the NFO block 
have to bid higher to get this production, and this creates new competition. Well, now, I'm going to leave you for a minute and turn to Don here, who's had a pretty easy time over the last minute or two. Don, uh, although you have a large staff of trained personnel working, as has been explained, there are tens of thousands of volunteers with NFO working without pay. Now, why do these people do this? Well, definitely they're the backbone of the whole effort, Bill, and I think I can explain that with the help of a chart here on hog prices generally. Uh, about a four to six dollar higher market here on about a stable supply over quite a quite a period of time. Mm -hmm. So these county leaders, being the progressive farmers that they are, realize that they are getting some recompense for this effort. Yes. And uh, four to six bucks a hundred is uh, is pretty good to take. It is indeed. Uh, that's the hog producer. We've got another example in the dairy production here. And this is a price chart graph for the summer of 1967, just after our milk holding action. And this lower line shows the price level projected by USDA for that summer. And this higher line indicates the actual prices that dairy farmers receive. So I think they've been repaid, and they certainly feel that they have. Don, what do you feel is the most important things that the farmers must do? Just a couple of simple steps. The one is to maintain good communications, block that production, so that the buyers of farm commodities uh, must come to the NFO block for their supply. It's just that simple. Jim? You've talked about how the structure operates. Do you keep flexible enough in NFO that you're able to move production over and above the contract commitments? Yes, we do, and this is due to the fact that we have a communication structure, and as we have seen the communications in operation, when we went out had a call in from the West Omaha marketing area, mm -hmm. we had an additional 1,000 head of cattle over and above contract commitments. As we have seen, this was called in by the marketing area chief to the National Office Communications Department. This information was given to the meat department. They got in contact with packers to find an outlet for the additional 1,000 head of cattle. Then we called back to the marketing area office, and they have notified the members who have the additional 1,000 head, and they are being delivered, as we have seen in this film today. Have a good vacation. Thank you. He's been anxious to get away, Don, so let's wish him uh, what bone voyage or whatever you say to some. What are you going to do? Go home to the farm and work. work? Right. Do we have here, folks, a couple of people with farm backgrounds? Uh, both Don and Jim are farmers. Where is your farm, uh, Jim? Well, I'm in southern, south central Illinois, uh -huh. about 40 miles north and east of St. Louis, well, Missouri. Have a good vacation. Thank Don't you. work too hard. How about you, Don? Where's your farm? Northeast Iowa, near Cedar Falls. It's been a real pleasure talking to both of you today about communications. We want to thank you so much for bringing these interesting points to U.S. Farm Report. Our guests today have been Don Zamalek, who is Director of Communications for the National Farmers Organization, and his very able assistant, Jim Horn. U.S. Farm Report is seen every week on this station. Until we meet again, goodbye, everybody.